2,000 years ago, the most incredible, important event in human history took place. A short, Jewish, little-known itinerant preacher in the far eastern parts of the Roman Empire, a homeless man, a man who had a small group of followers, a man who was saying things that no one else had ever said, a man that many believed to be a prophet and even the Messiah, this man raised himself from the dead. And for 2,000 years, we have formed a group of people called Christians, the church, who worship this man because we believe that this resurrection was the beginning of everything changing. We believe that this man made a promise to everyone on earth that someday he would redeem and rescue us all. And that for those of us who find ourselves hopeless, afraid of death, sick, injured, forgotten, and lonely, we look at this Lord, this beaten, embarrassed, homeless man, crucified, naked on a Roman cross, who raised himself from the dead. We look to this man and say, I believe that because this man raised himself from the dead, that what he said was true, that he, is, he has begun a story in which everything will be redeemed, everything will be restored, everything will be rescued because he loves it and he intends to save it. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who raised himself from the dead 2,000 years ago, intends to save everything. And that's what Easter is about. He's our great rescuer, and he's coming to save us. I remember I was 16 years old. I had just made a personal decision to follow Jesus. Jesus saved me from the muck and mire that I was in in my teenage years, as many of us <laughs> found ourselves when we were teenagers anyway. He came to me and rescued me, and I decided to follow Christ with my life. And I, I realized that I was entering into a new reality. And the time when this came most clear was about a year after I very much dedicated my life to Jesus. And I found myself in Thailand on a missionary trip. We were there trying to not only share the gospel, but fighting sex trafficking and feeding the homeless and, and doing all sorts of good works in the name of, of Jesus. And something amazing happened. I saw, for the first time in my life, real, measurable miracles. And I saw them with groups of, of other people. And I often feel almost uncomfortable talking about these miracles because uh, sometimes it feels like I lose credibility with people. And yet I saw it with my own eyes. I, I saw these, at the time, what, what felt like bizarre, strange events happen. And I could never forget it. And I, I realized that when I saw these things happen, that I was, I was living in a different reality. The first, it was, it was our first day in Thailand. We had a, a project director. Her name was Kat. And she was dressed up like a sailor. We were on our way to do a, uh, a play for, for children out of school. And so her part was a sailor. So she had white pants on and a white shirt and a blue tie. And she was our leader. She was the one that had the heart for, for the, whole, the whole mission. One day when we were in Thailand, in Bangkok, a, a big metropolitan city, crowded, she was crossing the road. And there was a bus that looked more like a train than a bus. Imagine three bus links all connected so that you couldn't see behind the bus. And behind the bus, there was an off-ramp from a freeway that we didn't know about. As Kat was walking, she stepped past the bus, which was stopped, it was parked, and there was a lane behind there with a car going 
quite fast. And this car hit her. And it was terrifying because all of us in our group watched as this, this woman that we loved was hit by a car and flung through the air. And as she hit the ground, she, she tumbled. And everybody was, was uh, terrified and, and horrified at what had happened. We thought she had died. And we went to her and we got around her and we lifted her up. And we realized that she was completely fine. She was crying. But she had no bumps, no bruises, no scratches. And most importantly, these white pants that she was wearing were not even dirty. I didn't know what to do with that. I come from a very reformed tradition. I'm not at all, I don't have any kind of Pentecostal this or that, although I have nothing against it. So this was a new, a new experience for me to see something like this. And it set the tone for the whole trip. We, it was the first day we were there and it, and it set the tone. It was like what the enemy meant for evil, to, to take out our leader, to kill her, to, to be violent towards her. God somehow rescued her. And as we know, this type of a thing doesn't happen very often. Usually the good Christian faithful person when they're hit dies or gets seriously injured. And, and then when something like this happens, you realize, you realize that you're in a different reality. And so amazing, little amazing things like this started to happen as we continued to do the Lord's work in Thailand. One time we were in this um, village and they were waiting for the monsoon rains to come so they could, they could plant their rice. And when we were leaving, we hadn't been very effective sharing the gospel in this area. And the, the people from the local church said, the way you can pray for us is two things. First, pray for rain. And second, pray for this woman over here because she has a tumor on her neck and we could see this, this tumor jutting out. And so uh, we began to pray. And as we prayed, even when the, the, the Thai church was praying in a different language in Thai, you could sense that something powerful was happening. It's something, it was like electricity in the air. And we were praying and imploring God to bring rain to this, this hurting village and, and, and imploring God to rescue this woman with her tumor on her neck. And we prayed for about 45 minutes because almost everybody took a turn to pray and ask God. And, and when we started, the clouds were, it was a totally clear sky. And keep in mind, it hadn't rained for three months. And as we were praying, clouds rolled in. And at the end of our prayer, it started to rain. And then when we looked at this woman, the tumor on her neck had vanished. I realized I was living in a different reality. And although this is amazing, what we shouldn't do is say, okay, if I always pray, I'm always going to get a miracle. But rather, we should know that sometimes when we pray, especially when we have a good deal of faith, God reveals to us signs of his love and his resurrection. What I'm saying is that the woman hit by the car, the rain that came down, the tumor that was removed was a sign that Easter actually happened. And that that is just a small taste of what will happen in the end. That in the end, Jesus will have the last word and he will save us and rescue us and we will live eternally with him. This was Jesus' message, really. Jesus came into the world and if you were to Try and capture the thesis of Jesus' teaching, his message. You could do it in three simple words. Kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Either or. It's hard to read any of the gospels, the four gospels, and not see the theme of the kingdom of God over and over and over. The kingdom of God is the belief that we live in a different reality than the one most of the people in the world propose to us. In a world in which people say everything is material, that power matters the most, that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and you ought to survive and you ought to get back at people, and that lying is the right thing to do in a time of need, and that anger is somehow a good thing. In this world, Jesus says, no, we live in a different reality. 
in a world that says everything can be measured and understood through mathematic formulas, Jesus says, no, our world is more beautiful and exciting than that. And Jesus promises us that indeed we are living in a different reality, one that we can't see with physical eyes, one that we must see with spiritual eyes. Jesus, preaching the kingdom of God, is telling us that we live in a spiritual world that has spiritual rules, that speaks a spiritual language. And that if we can understand and receive the knowledge of this world, everything will be different. And so Jesus came with the, the big message and thesis in mind to show people what the spiritual world was like and to invite people to live in that reality, a world in which God has set the rules, and a world in which Jesus is king, and a world in which if you know these spiritual rules, everything in the material world can change. Listen, Jesus was very, very interested in this world, not just the world to come. In fact, Jesus very much wanted this world to be like the world which is to come, that is heaven. Jesus wanted earth to be just like heaven. That's why Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. At hand. He said that over and over. The kingdom of God has come to this place. And there was a, a feeling in his parables and the things that he said that there was something to celebrate about that. That something now was changing in this world, not just in heaven, that right now something is forming and, and taking shape. The, the story, the narrative is, is shifting in a fundamental way. Everything is going to be different now because the kingdom of God is on earth at hand. One of the most important pieces of the Lord's Prayer that we so often forget is Jesus says, Thy kingdom come, come where? Here to earth. Thy will be done. Where? Here on earth, in me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, the message I, I, I feel like I receive so often from believers is, is, well, just believe in Jesus, you go to heaven when you die. That's true. That is very much true. But there's more to it than that. Believe in Jesus and enter heaven now. Believe in Jesus and receive a spiritual reality right now, a life that is eternal. Many people say, pray a prayer, and when you die, you will go to heaven. But I think Jesus was saying, live a prayerful life, and heaven will enter your life right now. And you will be given something that is so rich and so full that even when you die, you will continue to live. Yes, in heaven, which is a wonderful thing. And this is what the kingdom of God was about. The invitation, inviting people into this new way of life. Well, a lot of people, when they were following Jesus, they heard these things that Jesus was saying, but it was, it was hard to, to believe that what he was saying about how you treat people, how you pray, how you live life, could actually change everything in this material world. So Jesus gathered around him disciples or students who would learn his teaching and take their yoke upon them. These men, these 12 men, and there was another group of 70, these people would follow Jesus and many of them left everything. Their family, they left their jobs. And with joy they followed Jesus and he, he began by teaching them these principles. But then when he began to live it out, they started to realize there's something special about this man. Imagine if you were Peter, what it would have been like following Jesus. One day you're, you're catching fish and this rabbi invites you to follow him. It's a great honor, a huge honor to have a rabbi ask you to, to follow him. He thinks you're good enough to take his yoke upon you and you decide, all right, I'm going to follow this man and I'm going to learn from him. And as you follow him, you think he's just a rabbi. I mean, that's a big deal, but you, you think he's a teacher, someone who's going to sort of coach you. And he was that. He was a rabbi. He was teaching Peter and the others. But then all of a sudden, there's a blind man, and he heals the blind man and says, the kingdom of God has come to you. And, and then all of a sudden, there's a, a dead girl, and he raises her from the dead. And then there's a woman that's bleeding, and, and he heals her. 
And then he begins to teach again. He heals a leper and says, don't tell anybody. Just know the kingdom of God is at hand. And now these people are starting to realize they, that these words, that this knowledge that is being given to them, these spiritual rules, and, and this, this idea that they live in a spiritual world is starting to affect everything in their material world around them in ways they never thought possible. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, uh, they are quite startled, of course. A man who was already stinking in his grave, Jesus raises him from the dead. And so the journey that Jesus' disciples take are from one first thinking he's just a teacher, then realizing, no, he's a prophet. But then going from prophet to seeing this man, Jesus, walk on a hill and the clouds part and God reveals himself to Jesus and Elijah is there and Moses is there and Jesus' very appearance changes. They now realize there is something different to the point where Jesus says to Peter, who, am, who do you think I am? Peter says, oh, some, some people say you're Elijah, some people say you're this person or that person or whatever. And Jesus says, who do you say I am, Peter? And with conviction, Peter says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. They knew at the end, they believed that Jesus was actually the Messiah that had been promised for hundreds of years that someday a Messiah would come and redeem and rescue Israel. And not just Israel, everyone, that the whole world would be saved. And so they're getting excited. They're seeing the dead raised. They're seeing the sick healed. They're seeing a new way of living, loving your neighbor, that the rules of the world are broken and that new uh, rules uh, about a spiritual world, the kingdom of God are being implemented and everything is exciting. And then all of a sudden, like on the turn of a dime, just in a few days, Jesus goes from this Palm Sunday experience where everybody is saying, Hosanna, we love you, we worship you. And in five days, he is executed on a cross in the most embarrassing, horrible, unjust way. How did that happen? How could this, this journey, I mean, everything was supposed to change. Jesus was supposed to be this great person and he dies on a cross. It's like having your savior die in an electric chair in our day or a noose. Horrible. And even what Jesus experienced on that cross, all of his friends left him except for the apostle John. He was beaten and whipped. He was showcased to everyone. They mocked him and hated him. And what did he do that was so bad? I mean, Jesus was preaching love and goodness and he was helping people. What did he do that was so bad? And see, Jesus on the cross is the fulfillment of his teaching. Jesus says, blessed are you when people persecute you because they persecuted the prophets before you. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. When someone forces you to go a mile, go with him too. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And here Jesus dies in the most awful, unfair, unjust way. And he does it with a quiet nobility. And one of his last words was, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Even when he was suffering, his heart was beating with love for the men who were nailing him to a piece of wood. Even as they nailed him and he suffered and he experienced hell on that cross, he said, I love them and I love you and forgive them, God. They don't know what they do. That's what love and the kingdom of God is like. And so imagine what it would have been like being a dis disciple. You, you think you're caught up and, and everything's going to be changed. Everything's going to be different because of this man. I mean, you are convinced. You spent the last three years watching the most incredible things. You've been writing them down. You've been keeping a history and, and keeping track of everything. And, and, and you, you feel like you're caught up in, in the shift that's going to change all of history. And then he just dies like this, a like a criminal. And so there's three days in which these young men who gave up everything to follow Jesus are trying to decide what to do with their lives. What do they do with this three-year experience? Everything was changed. They saw miracles and they got all this, what they thought was knowledge, and then just, he just dies. 
What do they do with this? And then the resurrection happens. The most incredible miracle, the most incredible event in human history, Jesus is raised from the dead by God. This little Jewish man in the eastern part of Israel, who was not a politician, who did not have a big degree, who was not wealthy, who did not have any real worldly power, who did not sit on any throne um, made by the, the world. This man raised himself from the dead. And that meant that he was and is God. That what he said was true. And that the knowledge, the most important knowledge that he gave us 2,000 years ago was knowledge about a world that most people do not know they are currently living in. That we live in a material world that follows spiritual rules and that those rules are true and given to us by Jesus. They are true because he raised himself from the dead. That means that Jesus controls death and controls life. It means that because Jesus was raised from the dead, we can trust him. It means that because Jesus was raised from the dead, his intention to save everything, to save this world, to bring heaven to this earth, that that, that's going to happen. And that for those of us who, who will die in this world before that happens, that even then he will rescue and save our souls for the day in which everything will be redeemed. The resurrection, which hundreds of people witnessed and wrote about and kept documents about and gave their lives for, the resurrection means that it's all going to change and that from that moment we know that Jesus will save everything. These men who witnessed the resurrection went with joy to their own execution because they had no fear, because they witnessed that this man who taught them and mentored them for three years, who who healed the sick, who raised the dead, and even raised himself after experiencing the wrath of God and hell, that this man is Lord, that Jesus is Lord, and that if they trust in him, that no acts No fire, no lion in a a stadium could scare them because they trust their lives to this great shepherd. And that's why the resurrection is so important. Jesus is Lord of death. Jesus is Lord of death. Jesus is Lord of life. Jesus is the Lord of this earth. And even now, even now as you listen on TV, he is working to redeem you and save you. He's going to save everything. And so many people who are sick, so many of you who are listening in your bed and you you couldn't even get out to go to church today because you're you're sick or weak. So many of you watching all over the world who are crippled by depression, who are hurting, who feel lonely and lost. You feel like you've lost everything. You're going through a divorce or you lost your wife or you don't don't know what's going to happen and you're afraid of dying. Jesus is going to save you because he loves you. Jesus is going to save you because he loves you. This man who lived 2,000 years ago is God and he's preparing a place for you. And even now, in the end, he will redeem everything. Dr. Mal, when he was here, gave a great story. Uh, He was here a few months ago and he said he always likes to read the last page of a novel. He loves reading scary books and mystery novels and All these awful things are happening, but when it gets really bad, he goes to the last page and he reads how everything turns out. And he does that so that while he's reading the rest of the book, he knows. Even when bad things are happening, he's read the last page. He doesn't know what's what's going on in the middle, but he knows what the last page says. In the end, it's all going to work out. In the end, we're going to look back at this and realize that all of this happened And all of this was a pathway to that last page. And that's what's happening in our lives. God will rescue us. Jesus will rescue us. Rescue our souls. 
We live in a spiritual world. In God's grand universe, which follows spiritual rules. He's given these rules to us. And he has proved it in his resurrection. And because he is the Lord of life, you can trust Jesus. And you can trust your life to him. And you can know that someday he will rescue you. And you will enter into an incredible eternal life with him. All you have to do is trust him and believe in him. And receive his love and grace. And he'll save you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we are so thankful today. We are so thankful that 2,000 years ago you raised your son from the dead that we might have life, that we would be forgiven of all of our sin, all of our shame, everything, and you would redeem us. Even in our, uh, even in our fallen nature, you would redeem us and hold us and hug us like the father you are to us and say, I will rescue you and redeem you, and someday... You will give us a new earth and new bodies, new life. And we thank you that you care about this world that we live in because you made it. It's your creation. And we pray, God, that we would learn from Jesus and trust our lives to the good shepherd. It's in his name we pray. Amen.